All right. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another episode of the Health Detective Podcast by Functional Diagnostic Nutrition. My name is Evan Transu, aka Detective Ev, and I will be your host for today's show, episode number 316 of the Health Detective Podcast. And we have what I call a full circle guest today. So what I mean by full circle, it's actually interesting. This just came up recently with another guest, Marja Chow. Um, we, this is someone who I actually enrolled into the course. This is someone who I originally got on a call with. We talked about the FDN course. We really related um, because I feel like you know she's kind of me in the past seven, eight years ago looking for schools to start out with and, hey, do I go to a college for this? Do I pursue this certification or this one? Um, and she even went through the other certification that I went through. So we'll talk about all of that today and more. Um, but Veda, welcome to the show. I will read your bio here and then we'll get into it. Veda is a dedicated health practitioner on a mission to guide individuals from the shadows of their health challenges into the brilliance of finding their inner glow. Having faced her own struggles navigating the ins and outs of the medical system, Lyme disease, crippling anxiety and depression, cystic acne, and much more, Veda understands the darkness that can cloud one's being. Committed to bringing light to others' health journeys, she established Wellness by Veda, offering personalized one-on-one -on -one coaching and employing a holistic, whole-body approach. With the insight gained from her personal struggles, Veda addresses mysterious symptoms often dismissed as normal, empowering clients to unlock their inner glow. Through her wellness business, she aspires to be a beacon for those feeding, feeling lost and sick, guiding them towards the light at the end of the tunnel and demonstrating that true well-being is within reach. It is so cool to get to do this podcast with you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I can't believe that it's actually happening. I know we talked last year on the phone and you mentioned, oh, maybe you can get on the podcast and here we are. So I'm yeah. so excited. Cool. So we got a lot to cover today. You went through so many health challenges, some very much um, overlapping with mine. I know you've listened to the show, so we'll start off with the same question that we always do. When did Veda's health symptoms begin and what did they look like? Yeah. So my health symptoms, they kind of came at me all at once. If I'm being honest with you, it started in 2018. So at this point, I was actually a junior in high school and it started with, I started getting these weird rashes all over my face, all over my body. And I, they'd come and they'd go. And I went to the dermatologist and they were like, oh, you need some moisturizer. So I tried the moisturizer. It obviously didn't work. They suspected it was just dry skin. Um, but the rashes were on and off. And then that winter, so that December, so December of 2018, I felt extremely ill I remember I just didn't feel right. I felt really fatigued. My throat started to hurt. And I remember telling my mom, it was like a late night. And I was like, mom, I need to go to urgent care. And she's like, oh, Veda, you're fine. Like, you can just hold it up until tomorrow. And I'm like, no, I need to go. So we went to urgent care. And I remember sitting in a chair. And next thing you know, I remember laying on a bed, my uh, feet over my head, doctors screaming in my face, um, the uh, ambulance coming to get me, my blood pressure dropped to like 60 over 40. I was just completely like I felt horrible. I was brought to the hospital, brought to the ER. Um, they admitted me. I was so weak. I couldn't even go to the bathroom at the hospital. I tried. I passed out. So I had to like pee on one of those bedpans in the bed. And it was just, it was a brutal experience to say the least. I got tested for everything. I got tested for influenza, strep, mono. I got labs um, done. Everything came back normal. So I went home, pretty much was bedridden for an entire week until I got my energy back. And so was that. I returned to school. I returned to the sports I was playing. And I was feeling pretty good. And just two months later in February, I fell extremely ill once again. And I didn't think I could get worse than I was in December, but here I was even sicker than I was. Um, once again, they ran all the labs. I was admitted into the ER. Everything came back normal. And I started experiencing, this time was a little bit different. One, I lost about 20 pounds in just a period of one week. I wasn't eating. I had no appetite. I had to crawl to the bathroom. I couldn't shower. And I was just a wreck. It was miserable. I was missing so much school. And at this point, I started to experience panic attacks. So I remember I just woke up randomly in the middle of the night and I just cried to my mom. And I was like, Mom, I like something's wrong. Like I feel sad. And I didn't know why I felt sad. And I think that was the most frustrating part 
because I wanted to put a label on it of like, oh, is there an external factor that's causing me all this anxiety? But I literally didn't know what it was. And little did I realize that that one panic attack that happened in February turned into hundreds of panic attacks. And I had panic attack almost daily. I couldn't go to school. And if I did try to go to school, I would get there and I would just start crying. And my peers would be like, why are you crying? Like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I don't know what's wrong. Um, I would see with the school counselor and I just felt miserable. I couldn't go to the grocery store. I couldn't go to just hang out with friends, do normal functions because I was so fearful of having a panic attack and just going into this like fight or flight or freeze state. And I just tensed up and I would just cry and I'd feel miserable and I didn't know how to cope with it. So that's kind of a little broad idea of what my beginnings of my health journey looked like. And on top of the panic attacks, my hair started falling out in clumps. I was so insecure about it. Um, I was a high school student and then I was a college student and it happened. And I have just super like thick, naturally thick hair. And my hair was thin. Like it was thinning out. It was turning pin straight. I was getting bald spots over my head. And at this point I was like 19, 18, 19 years old, getting bald spots. I was terrified to shower because I knew when I'd shower, I'd pull out clumps out of my hair. I didn't wear my hair down because I knew that I'd shed all the time. And all my friends pointed it out. Oh, Veda, you have so much hair on your back. You're shedding. And I was breaking out like crazy. I was so fatigued. I could not get out of bed in the morning, no matter how hard I tried, no matter if I got 12 hours of sleep, 14 hours of sleep, there was no getting me out of bed. And I just felt like an emotional and physical wreck to say the least. <laughs> okay. Wow. And so this was all going on. Did you have any weird health symptoms when you were younger? And what I mean is like, did you have little sporadic migraines, stomach issues, whatever, or was this truly like, Hey, this seemed to come out of nowhere. Yeah. I mean, growing up, I had like, I had headaches or I had stomach aches or I'd get the flu. Sometimes I'd have to take some ibuprofen or Tums, but it wasn't something that kind of kept me from living life. It was just your typical like, oh, you get sick a couple times in the winter. I mean, I, when I was younger, I didn't take care of myself at all. I just ate the traditional like American diet and followed all of those things. But it wasn't until this 2018 time where I really was like, something is seriously wrong. And it's just something I'd never experienced before. Okay. You also talked about the panic attacks and I, I think you and I both know this about each other. That was kind of what happened to me. I, well, I had a longer history of panic attacks that were sporadic, but then once a major one came, I mean, they're all kind of crappy to mm -hmm. be honest, but yeah. this major one came that I think was very unexpected. That's kind of why it happened. And then it was panic disorder. Now it really evolved mm -hmm. into, okay, this is a regular thing. My life is revolving around avoiding the next one or fearing the next one. What I'm curious about did you have the language at the time? I really, I know this is really only several years ago in a sense, but did you have the language to know what a panic attack was? Because you and I are just different enough in age that I'm wondering, like, is the education better in schools at this time that you knew what this was? Or was this like, holy crap, I, I've never heard of this? Yeah. So I think that the main reason I knew it was a panic attack was because I had one to the point where... I felt like I was going to die. Like I convinced myself because my breathing was so rapid. It felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest. And I remember laying on my back porch and my dad was pouring water over my head of being like, Beta, it's okay. You're not going to die. Like, it's okay. The ER had to come. The ambulance had to come. And they have to remind me like I'm in fact okay. And then they identified that as a panic attack. Mm -hmm. So I think because I went through that experience, I know what it felt like to have a, a panic attack and the symptoms that came with it. So then when I started experiencing them to the severity and having them almost daily, I knew that was a panic attack. Okay. Well, and yeah, obviously if they're identifying it too, if you're going to the ER, that's right. In, in a sense, a good thing. It is nice to actually have that label because it's already scary with the label. If you don't mm -hmm. have the label, I mean, people, I, I think this is a much safer place to share this stuff. And I assume either people know about this that are watching something like this or are at least open-minded enough to understand that even if they haven't gone through it, we're telling the truth. But uh, you don't need to believe us. This is something that you can go on Dr. Google and see right on the symptoms list. Panic attacks bring with them a fear of impending doom. That is one of the symptoms of the thing. So you don't have to understand that 
to realize that like, no, when you're going through that, your mind gets tricked and your body too gets tricked. Your body's very involved in this into believing, okay, I need to go do something. Otherwise, well, not everyone reacts in the same way. I shouldn't say that. I was more of a flight person. I'm like running around the house. I got to go somewhere. Otherwise I feel like I'm going to die. Some people are like, they're freezing up, right? So there's a variety of ways that people try to cope with this and none of them work very well. It's a pretty intense experience one time, let alone hundreds, as you mentioned. What was your thought process as all this was going on, especially in high school. And what I mean is, yes, you have the labels for these things, but there still had to be so much confusion, especially as you're ending up in the hospital, having these very scary bouts of like health issues, losing weight and stuff. Like, what did you think was going on? Oh, that's a great question because I feel like that's something I asked myself multiple times when I was going through this. Um, Like I had mentioned earlier, I just wanted to find a label why was I feeling this way? Like, just give me answers. I was going to the doctors, they weren't giving me answers. And at some point, I thought that was just going to be my life. Like that was just going to be my forever, um, having to deal with like debilitating depression, anxiety and hair loss, cystic acne, just all of these things that I kind of just got thrown off at thrown at me at once. And I mean, I don't really have an answer to that question, I guess, because I had that same question for myself of what is going on. That's okay. Yeah, I'm just, I I think I asked that admittedly half selfishly because I was so confused back then that when Mm -hmm. I do get someone on the show, uh, this is a question I ask often, if the person dealt with these things in their childhood or teenage years, I'm always like, yeah, what the hell were you guys thinking? Because I had no Mm -hmm. idea what was happening. (laughs) So were you treated for these things by Western medicine? Because I mean, it's pretty hard to have hundreds of panic attacks and someone doesn't at least offer you an SSRI or benzodiazepine. Um, Were you being treated by Western medicine for this stuff? Yes. So eventually I did get put on Lexapro. I kind of tried to like avoid it for a little bit because I didn't want that to become my reality. I had never really struggled with anxiety, depression, and I guess it was kind of this sense of refusal. And I didn't want to accept the fact that I had debilitating depression so bad that I needed to be put on an antidepressant. But I got to the point where I was so desperate. I was like, I can't keep living like this. I need help. And I did get put on Lexapro. And I was on that for roughly a year, I would say, and now I'm not on it. Um, But it did help me a little bit, not as much as I expected it to, but it helped me manage my day to day life much more. I appreciate the objectivity and transparency in saying that because I think I still piss people off with this because uh, the functional people that is because I'll be like, well, no, I'm not against a- at all the medications with this. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh my God, do you know the side effects of Xanax? Do you know the side effects of the SSRIs? I'm like, yeah. I'm not saying that's the only thing I want people to have. I'm like, do you know what it's like to have panic disorder and deal with hundreds mm-hmm. of panic attacks? Like, trust me, I can work through the Xanax stuff. The hundreds of panic attacks, that's debilitating. Um, exactly. So I totally get that and respect it. And it's not forever. It shouldn't be forever. That's what we're missing. It's like, okay, use the medication now. This is my life jacket. This is keeping me afloat so I'm not drowning. And then let's figure out how to get the hell to the side of the river using the natural and lifestyle stuff. Um, I see that you already have two comments here, which is cool. Taylor said, I love Veda and the Health Detective Podcast. I listen daily. Well, thank you, Taylor. That's awesome. Uh, Sarah said, these are my symptoms. I'm about to start FDN training and I hope I can heal myself. Well, we'll get into that today, Sarah. That's for sure. So um, stay tuned. Veda, you obviously, I already know this about you, decided to pursue this as your passion, as your career. Um, And I'm curious because how old are you now? I'm 21. Okay. So so you're not even really (laughs) technically old enough to have been finishing a normal four-year or five-year degree. Yes. Um, And you've already done IIN and FDN, which is amazing. And I know there's some social pressures that come with that. It's like this idea of, okay, hey, am I going to avoid normal college or add these things on when everyone else is doing this four-year thing or eight-year thing or whatever they're uh, pursuing degree-wise? So I'm curious because I actually don't remember this. Did you do a normal college route? Are you pursuing that? Or was it just IIN and FDN? So I did. I graduated last year, oh, nice. May of 2023. I gradu- graduated a year early. So I did something called the degree in three. I have my bachelor's in psychology. And then right after that is when I hopped on a call with you and I decided to enroll in FDN, IIN. Um, it was a lot. My uh, adrenals didn't like that for a while. But here I am. And I'm very thankful that I did it. 
Okay, cool. It's always the overachievers. That, it's like, of course you did the degree in three things, of course. Um, but yeah, I remember when we were talking, you were actively, I think you had just signed up for IIN and of course you did their accelerated program. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember that. So that's kind of funny. But what? how did you get even introduced to them and how did you get introduced to us? Because like, it's very specific stuff that goes into the marketing to like actually try to find the people that want to join these types of courses. So how did you find these uh, courses, IIN and us? Yeah, so honestly, through social media is where I found both of them um, through my own health journey um, and for my desperation for answers and not getting them from Western medicine, I did seek out a naturopath. And through that is when I did get diagnosed with Lyme disease. And that was the answer to all of my questions. I remember in 2020, it was I was a freshman at college and I got a call from my doctor saying you tested positive for Lyme disease, co-infections, all the things. And it was almost a sense of relief because it was like I have answers as to why I felt the way that I did. And I had had Lyme disease for so long and I couldn't just go on an antibiotic to treat it. I would have had to been on it for like a year. And obviously, we know that's not good. So I did do the more herbal route. I changed my diet. I focused on like anti inflammatory foods. And it was a learning process for sure. I mean, I loved my goldfish. I love my Cheez Its. Like, I loved all the glutenized foods. And the thought of having to cut them out didn't happen overnight. Um, but it was a huge process in my healing journey. And I learned a lot about myself. I learned that my body can heal. And I learned that my body needs the functional medicine habits and aspects of that in order to heal. And I started to feel absolutely amazing. And that's when I started following people on social media that kind of posted what I was now interested in. And I noticed in their bios, they had like IIN health coach or FDNP. And I was like, Ooh, like, what's that? And just through my healing journey, I grew a huge passion for health and wellness industry because I saw on myself and felt how it changed me. And I kind of just grew this passion of I now want to help others in that same light. So I here I am, I enrolled in FDNP and IIN and thankful for social media because that's kind of where I found all of you guys. Okay, this is awesome. I have one more question before we talk about how to actually overcome all this stuff and where you're at yeah. now. Um, but I, I just find this stuff so fascinating. How did you go to a naturopathic doctor? And for some people listening, it doesn't sound that profound, but I'm thinking about your story and what you just said. So you're either in your late teens or very, very early 20s, like 20 years old when you did that. It takes a certain person to think outside the box, regardless of their experience with Western medicine, to say, hey, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try the person that a lot of people probably dismiss or say they're not a real doctor or they're a hippie or whatever it is. Did you have an influence that led you to do that? How did you end up in the naturopathic's office? Yeah. So fortunately, I did have an influence. My mom, she had been seeing a naturopath for a couple of years prior to this because she has her own gut issues and all of that. And I remember her telling me like, Veda, this is not normal. Like you should not have, I think honestly, my hair falling out was her biggest alarm. She's like, um, like there was clumps of hair and she's like, this is not normal at all. So I signed up an appointment with her naturopath doctor and I got some labs done. They were crazy a mess. <laughs> I didn't originally get tested for Lyme right off the bat, but that's kind of how I found the naturopath doctor. And I'm very thankful that I did. Cool. All right. Just interested. That makes total sense. Good mom. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> who knows? I mean, seriously though, who knows if she wasn't going there, how much longer all of this could have taken. Uh, sometimes sure. it just takes that one person in our life or that one little spark of inspiration in our life to completely change the course. I, I am fascinated by how people get into this stuff. So you decided, all right, I'm going to take the pain. I'm going to turn it into purpose. And I also thought it was interesting that you wanted to do both of the programs at the same time. So this show, there are many people, including myself, who have went through IIN first and then pursued FDN. There's also people that have been through other health coaching programs and then pursued FDN. So this is not a bash IIN thing. They have great coaching stuff, really exceptional coaching stuff, actually. So how did you make the decision that, hey, I need to do both of these at once? Why did you feel like one was incomplete? without the other? Yeah. So I knew I wanted to do both. And the reason for that is because that's the typical pattern that everyone follows on social media that I followed. They typically did IIN, got their health coach certification, and then went into FDN. So I just thought that's what I should do. Just follow that norm. 
and doing them both at the same time kind of just aligns with my type A personality and feeling like I need to do it all at once. Um, and I actually wasn't going to enroll in FDN until later on, but thankful for our call, you kind of convinced me to do it, which I'm so happy I did. No regrets about that. Um, but yeah, not to bash IIN at all. I loved that program as well. It really helps set the basis of like what health is. Like it talks just about the basics of health and really gets a good grasp on like what we know in FDN as the dress protocol. It just helps you get a grasp on that. Um, but FDN is really what kind of changed the game for me, if I'm being honest. I had already known a lot of health tips and tricks that was taught in IIN because of my own health journey. So it wasn't until I enrolled in FDN where I was like, wow, like I learned so much about the human body and I learned more about myself. And it was absolutely fascinating. Cool. You have like a fan base here, just so you know. Now there's another Sarah, Sarah with an H saying, your mom is so proud of you and all of your accomplishments. FDN has helped you inspire so many. This is great. Um, <laughs> now for Sarah without the H who said she's about to start FDN and it's hoping it can uh, heal her. I'm curious, you were at a much better state of health, it sounds like, by the time you pursued FDN. But one of the things that we do is we include the labs and the cost of tuition. So if I'm able to ask, what came up on those labs for Veda, who was not brand new to this? You're not like a spring chicken in it. You've already done some things. So what were on the labs when you went through? Yeah, so despite me feeling a lot better, my labs were not perfect. <laughs> Um, there was definitely a lot of work to improve on, but I did come a long way. I had gotten like a GI map test before and a stress and hormone profile test done before, and they were definitely improved, but I still had like I had H. pylori pop up. My commensals were very low. Um, my liver was, oh boy, was that congested. <laughs> that was super high. Uh, the urinary bile acids and then my histamine was off the charts. I had some hormonal imbalance. So there was still, um, the lab test revealed a lot of information that was kind of left unsaid. And in a sense, and I think people only understand this if they go through this or if they've worked with someone like you, it's a good thing, right? If you feel good mm -hmm. and you find stuff to work on, that's about as good as it gets, man, because now you can take proactive action on those things before something comes back or before a big stressor in life happens and throws you over the edge. Because really, if we're walking around with those types of things, we're just waiting for something kind of severe to happen and it will throw us over the edge. So if you can address that now, that's that's awesome. Um, I want to focus now on the topic of Lyme. Of course, there's a million things that you went through, but it seems like that's something that you're super passionate about. So what of the symptoms that you had, maybe it's all of them, do you consider to be hidden symptoms of Lyme? I I think most people, if they know anything about it, I only know about it extensively because I live in Pennsylvania and it's one of the worst states for Lyme disease about, I think the best County, which is nuts, the best County in Pennsylvania, 25% of the deer ticks carry Lyme. The worst is like 40%. So you really, I mean, it's every time you walk out in the grass, it's like an, a war out there. You got to be careful. Everyone checks themselves when they come inside, if they know anything about this. Um, but you would expect, okay, I get the rash or I, I find the um, tick on me. I see the bullseye. In worst cases, you can get the Bell's palsy and your face is actually all messed up. You get crazy pain sometimes in your shoulders. So that's about the extent that the average person would know if they're lucky enough to know that at all. Which of these symptoms do you consider to be like hidden ones that people don't typically associate with it? Yeah, I think uh, one thing to point out for sure is Lyme isn't just a rash, like a bullseye rash on your body, or actually seeing the tick or getting joint pain, because I didn't have any of that. I did have rashes, but they weren't considered a bullseye rash. And I would honestly categorize all my symptoms as lingering symptoms of Lyme, because the Lyme, like ticks, they attack your body, they destroy your body. And all of the symptoms that I had, they may have not specifically stemmed from that tick bite, but they may have stemmed from my adrenal health, thyroid health, gut health, liver health. But all of that was corrupted from that actual tick bite and from the actual Lyme disease. But I think one of the biggest things that indicated looking back that I had Lyme was how sick I was and how fatigue I got. Fatigue is a huge one. Um, if you struggle with fatigue, that could be a huge culprit of Lyme disease. Um, ever since I've kind of treated myself for Lyme disease, my fatigue like, is not an existent. I don't really have fatigue. Like I have normal energy throughout the day. Never thought I'd be here saying that. 
But I think that just be cautious of your symptoms. If you're going to the doctors, if you're getting lab tests done and you're doing the things and you still don't feel right, that's when I think that getting tested for Lyme disease is really beneficial. And be cautious because if you go to Western medicine, not to bash them, but the way that they interpret a Lyme disease test is very different than functional medicine. So they may tell you that you're fine, you don't have Lyme disease, but if you were to have that looked at someone else in the functional medicine field, they'll tell you you tested positive for Lyme. Okay. Well, and not to mention the whole chronic Lyme is not really something that's recognized fully by Western medicine. I remember, you know, when the first term of long haul COVID came out and people were acting like this is like some brand new concept. I'm like, okay, we see this all the time with immunocompromised people or people living a sad lifestyle, standard American diet lifestyle, right? If they get Lyme, some of them keep it forever. Unintentionally, of course, you were trying to do this, but unintentionally this happens. And it's the same thing with long haul COVID. I mean, I got COVID twice. I was sick for 24 hours the first time, 36 the second, completely fine after that, no long haul symptoms or anything. But if you're already in a weakened state, which Western medicine wouldn't even tell you or call you to be in a weakened state, they'd just be like, oh, you're just a normal American. Then eh, that's a little scary because you have this long haul stuff and you think it's like a unique condition. It's like, well, I don't know if it's long haul per se. It's like we couldn't handle it to begin with. Um, Now the Lyme's a nastier one though, in my opinion. I actually do think that, I think there's decent evidence to imply that some people, even if they were doing a lot of the right stuff and got Lyme could still actually feel quite bad. So if we're living a standard American diet and we get it, that's just another, that's a double whammy, right? And so in your opinion, I think you had already said this, but just to be clear for people, do you, would you ever consider running this in a foundational way, like just with every client, or is it something that you think shouldn't really be looked at until maybe every other option's been exhausted, or maybe if they're in a high risk area, like if you saw me with chronic illness as your client and I'm from Pennsylvania, would that be something you'd look at? Yeah, I think it wouldn't be on my priority list just because um, with my personal experience before actually getting rid of the Lyme, I mean, Lyme's always going to be my system, but it wasn't like activated or flared, I guess you could say, is just cutting out the standard American diet and following a healthy routine and just implementing all these healthy habits. I noticed a huge change in my Lyme symptoms, like they almost disappeared. And that was without actually attacking the Lyme. (laughs) So I think that that in itself, focusing on that first can make a world of a difference. But if you were my client and you had, we went through all the things and you still felt like there was something missing, then that is when we should maybe consider some Lyme testing to see if there's a deeper stress going on. Because as we talk about in FDN, and if you're an FDN and you're watching this, you understand that sometimes we have hidden infections, but it's figuring out if this is a distress or a eustress. So I think that would come down to, have we tried everything? If you still don't feel okay, maybe Lyme could be the culprit. I think that's another really um, kind of objective and even I I would say mature uh, viewpoint on this because what happens to a lot of us, myself included, is we get into this space and you know, we do the foundational stuff, but then we find like the one or two things that were really aggravating to us. And now we think everyone in the world uh, needs to get that test. And no, it's important to be aware of it, but that's not necessarily the case. Not everyone has Lyme. Not everyone has uh, very, you know, varied parasites, very varied parasites. Uh, Not everyone has Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So we don't need to screen everyone for everything, but this is definitely a tool to have in the tool belt and something to look out for. It's just, again, where does the person live? Um, where did they grow up? What do they do? Because they live in Pennsylvania, but they live in Philadelphia and work in an office all day? Or do they live in Northeastern Pennsylvania and they hike every weekend when they get free time? There's huge differences to these things. And this is why we always do a thorough intake as FDN practitioners and really any functional health coach should be doing that. So in terms of how to overcome this and get to where you're at now, because there's certain things you can't hide. I mean, you have verbal fluency to you. You don't have the brain fog, it seems. Um, You have an energy, you have a passion for this. You can't fake those things. Those things come from getting healthier and healthier. So uh, first I'll ask before we get into, I guess, to how to do it, how do you feel nowadays? And if it's your first time tuning into the show, not everyone has to be 100% to be on the show. We're looking for people on the journey here. So where would you say you're at right now? Is it 80% better or 70%? Um, If I were to compare myself to my 2018 years, 2018 year uh year self um if i'm saying that right um i would say i'm 100% better from then <laughs> i like looking back there i don't know how i survived i 
I was a wreck and I was miserable, but now knowing what I do and I'm always streaming, uh, trying to achieve optimal health. And so as of now, looking ahead, I would say I'm about 80%. Looking back, 100%, but looking ahead, 80 especially just seeing my lab markers. I still have some lingering symptoms that I still want to work on. And I have, ever since I did get Lyme disease, I have had anemia. And that's one thing that has not changed in my lab markers. So now I am actually trying to address some parasites and doing a parasite protocol because I'm curious if that could be the hidden stressor of what's causing some of these lingering symptoms. Sure. Okay. In terms of things that people can do then now knowing where you're at with your health, I'm sure many people that are listening today, uh, maybe Sarah without the H is thinking like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to be in this position. You mentioned that you did what we would call foundational stuff, um, dress stuff. So let's just be clear about what that is. Is that removing gluten? Is that going to bed on time? What did that, what did that look like that got a lot of your symptoms already better without doing anything specific for Lyme? Yeah. So I feel like it can be a combo of all the things. I mean, Cutting out gluten for sure was probably one of my biggest things, but it's just trying to implement new habits and take the old habits that you were doing and trying to change them into new healthy ones. So like some things that really helped me was cutting out gluten and inflammatory foods, um, focusing on prioritizing like three big balanced meals a day, um, having a routine, a morning and night routine, getting sunlight, all the things that are completely free that you can start doing every single day. I truly noticed the biggest difference for sure. Nice. And then in terms of the specifics, this is where we might get a little bit nerdier here. You know, antibiotics are powerful and whether or not we want to take them, we can't deny they do work. They do save lives in very infectious disease cases um, or in infectious disease cases, I should have said. And it certainly can work for Lyme. But, but one of the scary things is even Western medicine recognizes sometimes it doesn't work. So the idea for certain people that might listen to something like this, that, you know, natural stuff can somehow fight this, uh, might seem a little crazy at first. They might be skeptical of that. So what specific things did you do to target the line? Like what protocols did you go through? I know we can't get into all of it in a short podcast, I suppose, but I'm just curious what did you do to start targeting the Lyme specifically rather than just, Hey, these are general lifestyle habits I should do. Yeah. So my naturopath actually kind of created some tinctures for me to take, and they just had a lot of herbs in it that helped kill off Lyme disease um, and helped with like detoxification and doing all of those things. I don't know off the top of my head, like what specific herbs were in it, but that was the protocol that I followed. And I know for those of you who are listening, it can be intimidating. Um, you want that antibiotic, it's a quick fix. Maybe it's seven days and you're good to go. Um, but one thing I do want to point out with that is it may get rid of it in seven days, but your symptoms may come back. It's like that trial and error thing of you try something, you get that instant gratification. So then next thing you know, you're ill again with something, you try it again. And then it's just that consistent pattern. And using herbs and changing your lifestyle habits, it can definitely be daunting. It can be scary, especially if you don't know where to start. And it can take a very long time. I mean, one thing I always like to remind my clients is, when you're ill, it didn't happen overnight. So don't expect to get better overnight either. But it's one of those things that if you put in the time and effort into just implementing all these healthy habits and maybe doing something like herbs down the road, you're going to feel so much better and you won't be getting stuck in that trial and error for the rest of your life. That's wonderful. And there's so many resources in the world of functional medicine. Now there's different protocols. There's always hope for this kind of stuff. So, you know, we're not suggesting don't listen to your doctor or don't take the antibiotic. That's fine. But you might need more even if you do take the antibiotic. That's just something to keep in mind. The only person I've really seen fly through this is my best friend, Jake. He's like the opposite of me. He is very chill, no health issues ever. I remember he told me when we were in high school, he didn't know what a headache felt like. I said, you've never had a headache? He's like, no, I've never had one in my life. I'm like, okay, of course, you're the person who would say that. But the point of me bringing him up is he got Lyme disease when he was landscaping for my dad when we were younger and he got the Bell's palsy and stuff. And he did a round of doxycycline, which is a nasty antibiotic, but he did that. He was asymptomatic. It's been six, seven years and he's still good to go. So some people can pull that off. But, you know, if he ever started to get stuff, I was always kind of watching out for him in the back of my head. I'm like, all right, if I start to see something weird or changes in him, I'm going to be like, let's let's check this out because you were fine before this. And now this occurred. 
what what's going on. So for you now, you already mentioned that you have clients, which is very impressive. This is awesome. Uh, what does the next phase for Veda look like? Is this what you're going to be pursuing as full-time career? Will you be utilizing the psychology degree only indirectly? Or are you using that directly for career? I'm just so curious what your next steps are. Yeah. So, I mean, I did create Wellness by Veda. I launched it not too long ago. And I, my goal is to make this my full-time career. I am so passionate about helping people, especially because I've gone through my own health journey. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to feel stuck. And I've just learned so many tips and tricks and tools. And I know what it feels like to just be depressed and dark and alone and feel like you have no answers. And that's what really motivates me every day to find clients and to help my clients in the best way possible. So yeah, my goal is to make this my full-time career and hopefully help as many people as I can find answers for themselves. And psychology with my degree, it, I do try to like include it a little bit with my clients. I know that mindset is huge. Stress is the root of all evil. And I really want to hone in on that specifically with my clients of mastering your mindset and working on stress. And I think that's when my psychology degree definitely will come into hand. This is awesome. So of the people, I know that we have to be careful with privacy or for privacy's sake, but with the clients that you're taking now, like what types of people are you attracting so far? Is it people your age? Are you working with the friends and fam? Like I'd love to know. Yeah. So I've actually attracted people some people in my age, I mean, I am very young. So most of the people are above my age. I've honestly worked with people from the age of like 23 to like 63. Um, I've had a few different people there. Um, but yeah, I've just been like trying to share my story on social media and just trying to attract anyone that I can who's really just looking for more answers. And with what you're doing now, I mean, again, you've had a lot of health symptoms. So yes, when we do the business side, we're going to help anyone, but we also kind of teach to maybe focus more on a niche just to kind of attract a, a certain type of person. So who is your ideal client now? Like if you could wave a magic wand and you get this perfect person coming to your door virtually, uh, who would that be? What would they be dealing with? Yeah, so my biggest passion is women's hormones, um, specifically PMS and cycle syncing. Cycle syncing is something that I've learned more about over the past couple of years. And boy, has it helped me so much. Um, it's made me feel so much better, like just learning how to work out with my phase and eat well with my phase. And especially considering my age, I think that that's something that I would love to just help like a person who's in college or late in high school or in their late 20s, early 30s, or any of that who's just struggling with like PMS symptoms and absolutely dreading their period. I, I used to be that way. I'm like, oh, it's that time of the month. Like, got to get the ibuprofen and put on a heating pad. Um, but I don't want people to feel like that. I mean, this is I want women to embrace their bodies and be able to embrace their 28 day cycle that they have. So I guess that would be that's definitely my biggest passion and who I would love to work with. That's cool. I've seen a lot of success for people doing something similar, even in that age range. A uh, shout out to Johanna Updike. She does awesome with this. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of women that want this. I think women one suffer with a lot more chronic disease, health issues. They're seven times more likely to deal with autoimmune. That's different depending on where you look and what papers you read, but it's certainly more uh, common than men. I think they're just more aware of health too. I think they're like generally interested or genuinely interested in doing something about their health where a lot of us guys, I mean, it can be like pulling teeth sometimes to get us moving in the right direction. I really had to have a lot going on before I'm thinking, okay, maybe I need to admit that I need some support with this. <laughs> That'd be a good idea to do. When you were going through the FDN course, and I would I would really, really like an honest and objective answer here. So if you have things that we can work on, that's totally fine. But for someone that is younger, I know when I went through this, I mean, I was 21 years old. So it can be intimidating. And you're like, can I really make a career out of this? Don't I have to take the traditional college path? Do you feel like the tools were given to you uh, to equip you for success? Um, are there things that you would have liked to see improved? Again, you can give a totally honest and open answer there. Yeah, no, I think that if you're in your 20s or like my age and you're fearful of joining FDN and kind of going maybe a different route than your peers. I mean, I've had a lot of people reach out to me on social media can I do this? Like, how, how did the schedule look like? Were you able to implement it? 
like I say, go for it. Like you can a hundred percent do it. And honestly, you find time for what matters. And if you have a passion for health, if you want to learn more about your body, like maybe you're just learning, you're using this course and maybe not necessarily start a business, but just to learn more about yourself and through the functional labs, you can definitely make time for that and you can find time for it. And FDN, I mean, you have a year to complete it. I was fortunate enough to complete it in five months. But once again, that's just my type A personality. So you have the time and resources to do it. And FDN, and I'm not just saying this to be biased, but it was truly the best schooling I've ever done. Even with my college degree, even with IIN, I absolutely loved it. I learned so much. And there was days that I hate to admit it, but I would stare at doing modules from the time I woke up to the time I go to bed because I was just so intrigued. I think it was like module six when it was going over the gut and I was like, tell me more, tell me more. So I think like, go for it. If this is something that you're interested in doing, like this is your sign to do it. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's super relatable for a lot of us uh, that just, you know, when we find this and it's what we loved and what we wanted, it's an obsession, you know? And Mm -hmm. I remember it's so so cool seeing you now because I'm like, damn, this was seven, eight years ago. Like, wow, I'm getting old. It's a bit scary. (laughs) But on the same side, it's like, I just remember that it was so much different than what my, all my friends were into. But I remember it was Friday and I'm like, I don't want to go out. I just want to go do this, right? I don't want to go be around the BS. I just want to study this and figure this out and uh, do this with my life. So with my questions that I normally ask, we actually ended up still having about nine minutes left. So I'd like to ask just some fun ones that I always have in reserve. Um, One fun one is out of the foundational lab tests at FDN, what is your favorite one and why? Oh, that's a great question. I feel like all of them have such good benefits, but I got to go with the GI map. I think that is definitely my favorite. I know it's probably so cliche to say that, but it just gives you so much insight and gut health is, oh, it like affects your body in so many different ways. It affects your hormones. It affects your liver. It affects so many different parts of your body. And if your gut is out of balance, then you likely aren't going to feel your best. And Now that I actually know how to interpret a GI map, I nerd out on them. When I get a client that enrolls with me, I'm like, let's get your GI map. I can't wait for the lab to send me the results. And I'm just like, oh my God, this popped up, this popped up. And that's honestly probably going to be my favorite. It's so fascinating, especially because everyone's are just so different. Mm -hmm. Nice. Maddie loves that one too. So in another question, again, just kind of fun ones with people that are in our age range, but especially yours, because it's a, it's a different time in life, man, because you got people that are coming out of high school and you're probably still friends with some of them, or maybe you're friends with someone who'd like just graduated from that a year ago. And then you have people that are fully graduated college and starting careers and lives. What is one thing that you kind of wish people in that age range, guy or girl, uh, what's one thing that you wish that they knew about health? Because I feel like I already know a bunch of people in my life that I grew up with that are, have a variety of health challenges. And you know, I do the speaking in schools. Like when I've gone back, I'm like, oh my God, this next generation is even sicker than ours, like by a notable amount. So what's one thing that you wish they all knew about these symptoms and diseases that they're getting diagnosed with? Oh my God. Uh, do we have another hour? <laughs> <laughs> I could go on and on about that. There's so many things that people are so oblivious on and it's so sad that they're just not educated on it and people just they don't teach that in schools I mean the college I went to my degree wasn't nutrition but even if my degree was nutrition I'm sure they'd be telling you a lot of things that FDN probably doesn't necessarily agree with and I think I mean it was hard for me growing up in when I was in college I was the odd one out like you said on Friday nights I wasn't going out and having drinks with my friends I was laying in bed, cast oil pack on, dandelion root tea in my hand, like in bed by nine, like that was my jam. And that's what I loved. Because that's what made me feel my best. But I think my number one piece of advice for sure is, and it's something I love to encourage people on is seed oils. Like seed oils really get me. They're in literally every single thing that people eat, and they're so oblivious to them. I remember not to call my roommates out if they watch this, but like they cook with canola oil and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> this is not good for you. Um, but it's definitely hard sometimes to like bite my tongue and just be like giving them the eye of why are you doing that? But I mean, a lot of people just aren't educated, unfortunately. Yeah, it doesn't taste nearly as good either. Like when you really learn how right. to <laughs> with ghee or avocado oil, I mean, I don't know. I think it tastes a lot better. If 
someone is out there listening today and maybe they're not just some random young person, but they're actually a young person that very much relates to what you went through or what I went through. And they're in the midst of this. You know, they want to actually be doing all this fun stuff with their high school friends or their college friends. And they're kind of only seeing the negative side of this right now, because I know I could I think I could speak for both of us with this. I know looking back, we wouldn't change a damn thing, right? Because we've created passion out of this and purpose out of all of this. But if you're in the midst of it, that can be very hard to view these problems through those uh, that lens. So what would your advice be to um, Veda, you know, five years ago that's in the midst of these health challenges? Yeah, I think, I mean, if you have... If you know something's wrong, if your body is giving you a sign that something's wrong and you want to know why and you want to get get more answers, you just got to start somewhere. And I think a lot of people, especially maybe my age and people above my age, is they feel like in order to heal, they need to now change their whole lifestyle, their whole diet, just like that, like overnight. And that's not how it works. If you're listening to this, if you're in college, if you're a late high school student, don't feel like you need to be perfect. Don't feel like you need to have everything under the belt. Because a huge, like I said earlier, huge component of illness and disease is stress. So I don't want you to stop living your life. If you want to go out with friends on a Friday night, like that's what you can do. But the next day, maybe wake up and get a workout in or drink some lemon water to try to detox whatever you may have had the night before. Um, Or just implementing habits like that. Because a lot of the times, if you start to get in your head and you feel like you need to be perfect and you have this like all in or all out mindset, that's when stress really comes in and it wrecks a lot of issues. So it's just trying to find that 80-20 balance um, of trying to, you can still live your life. I'm not telling you you can't, but also still, if you do want to feel a little bit better, you do have to put in some work, but just trying to weave that in with living maybe that college lifestyle or whatever. I think that's excellent advice. I wish I heard that back then because I I did get into this perfectionist mindset. And then the irony of all of it is, of all of it is you're removing these bad things from your life to reduce stress. And I ended up creating just as much psychological stress. All the stuff I replaced physically, I was creating just as much psychological stress because anytime I screwed up, like, oh, this is bad, or now I'm going to have this because of it. And I was failing to see that I was looking day by day and I really been, should have been looking month by month or year by year. I could have seen Ev, dude, you are so much better than you were last year. You're eating organic. You're 20 years old. These people <laughs> don't even know what organic means. Like <laughs> you're doing okay. It's all right. Try to get a little better every month, not necessarily every day because you can't always see those results. So uh, this has been awesome. We already actually have your website in the chat here, so I will share that. But just so you can say it uh, verbally, please, for those that might be listening only on audio once this is out there, where can people find you website-wise, social if you use it? Let us know. Yeah, so I mostly use Instagram and TikTok, and you can find me at Wellness by Veda. And then my website is pretty much the same. It's just wellnessbyveda.com. Excellent. And Veda, I know you've listened to the show. I don't know if you've ever had the ability to listen to 50 minutes of Ev. So if you've gotten through to the end, then we have a signature question that we like to ask everyone. And that question is, if we could give you the power to get every single person in this world to do one thing for their health, whether that's literally start doing one thing, or you can force us all to stop doing one thing, what is the one thing that Veda would get us to do? I think I would tell you to stop overcomplicating it. It kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier is a lot of people just fall into this mindset of in order to get better, they need to literally change every single thing in their life or they won't feel better. And don't overcomplicate it. Just cutting out gluten for a week, you may notice a difference. And then you're like, oh, wow, my headaches went away. And now you're more motivated to go and do something else. I mean, for my health journey, I am not the same person I was in 2018. And I did not just start cutting out gluten overnight. It took time. But over time, you start to notice how better you how much better you feel. And then that encourages you. So I guess my main advice is just don't overcomplicate it. Just start simple and don't like overanalyze everything. Awesome. And then we have a wonderful comment, in my opinion, to finish it up. Taylor said, more people our age learning and sharing these tools is the best thing for our future generations and our children. Taylor, I couldn't agree more. And I think we all need to act as leaders in the space because the truth is no one wants to feel like crap. No one wants to have chronic symptoms or diseases. If we all lead the way with this and just educate people, we see more restaurants popping up that are Ev and Veda friendly, right? We see more people doing the blue light blocking thing and going to bed on time. It's not everyone. It's not the majority, (laughs) but it is happening. So 
slowly and surely. And if I, I really genuinely believe if we push this um, hard enough and long enough, then eventually people are just going to do this. And we get to have the benefits of the modern world where we can all enjoy, you know, going out on a Friday night, but we're all in bed by 9 p.m. <laughs> all that good stuff. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Veda, it's so cool to see how fast like you flew through everything and the fact that you're already out there taking clients. It's really impressive. Um, we have people double and triple your age that do not go out immediately and start taking clients through fears that they don't know enough or that they can't help. And I think you're proof that yes, you do know enough. You can go help. You just got to go out there and do it. So thank you so much for coming on the show with me. This is a really special episode. Yeah, 